All right. Um, welcome, everybody, to our To My Eye lecture um, on this Friday. It's a real pleasure to have um, Zainab um, Akata today. Um, she's a professor of computer science at the University of Tübingen. I believe you joined last year, as far as I remember. Um, and she's been doing some really amazing work. She's working um, now in the machine learning cluster on the Excellence Initiative there. And she's done a lot of incredible work in her career already, um, despite that she's been such a young researcher still. Um, she's been working on representation learning, few-shot learning, and generally anything that includes multimodal learning, explainable AI, and um, of course her work was also um, well recognized across the machine learning and computer vision communities. Um, she received a bunch of awards, um, the Lisa Meidner Award, she's a young scientist honor from the Werner von Siemens Ring, and also not surprising, she also received an ERC starting grant last, well, I guess a year and a half ago now. Um, and yeah, she's doing really amazing work and it, it's really great to have her um, and we're really, really excited to hear from her what she's going to say about the newest research. Thank you very much for the invitation and thanks everyone for joining my talk. I know that this week is especially difficult partially because of the CVPR rebuttals, but I hope it's going to worth your time. Um, I will talk about explainability and compositionality for visual recognition with minimal supervision. Uh, this title is a little bit convoluted, so uh, I will actually mainly discuss about two topics. One is zero-shot learning and one is explainability, and we develop these uh, models for visual recognition. And compositionality is one of my recent interests. I don't have much to show, but I wanted to still talk about it. Um, okay, so I grouped the topics into three. First, I will talk about learning with explanations using minimal supervision. Um, and then uh, I will move to how we generate those explanations uh, using attributes and natural language. And then I will summarize, uh, talk a little bit about ongoing work and then wrap up with some future ideas. Let's start with learning with explanations using minimal supervision. So um, if we look at uh, the data distribution in large scale data sets like ImageNet, we see that uh, we have a long tail distribution. Uh, for some classes like cars, we have a lot of examples, uh, but most of the classes are not represented with many examples. Uh, for example, this uh, is a Spanish firefly and uh, in ImageNet, there are only three examples of this class. And there are several reasons for this. Uh, one is these objects are usually rarely found in the nature. So taking pictures of these objects is difficult. And then um, naming them is difficult too, because you, we need expert opinions. We can't use Amazon Mechanical Turk for it. So my research focuses on the tail of this distribution. And one of the extreme uh, case of learning with limited late, uh, data is zero-shot learning. And uh, we use attributes to aid learning in this case. Um, so we have images and classes. Uh, so the classes need to be represented in a high dimensional space and we use attributes for this. And attributes are visually um, discriminative properties of, of objects like black and white, has tail, lives on land, and um, we don't necessarily have access to images, but uh, we want to build vectorial representations of classes using attributes. And some of these attributes are common, so the vector will have the same value in these two examples. And then uh, some of these attributes are specific to one class, so the zebra vector will have the values one for those attributes and whale class will have the value zero. And then some of these attributes are relative to each other, so this vector can have uh, values between zero and one as well. So after building this representation, now we can do, um, we can solve tasks like zero shot learning. And um, so this is a model, a very simple model that is composed of three components. Um, first, we embed images in an image feature space um, using a deep neural network like ResNet. And then uh, we embed labels in the class attribute space, the way I described before. This is a vectorial space. And, um, and these two spaces are fixed. So, and then we learn a, a compatibility between these two spaces. 
So the X's are the image features, Y's are the class attribute labels, and the W's are the parameters that we have to learn. And uh, this uh, projecting onto W ensures that um, if, so all the images that belong to the same class should be embedded close to each other and far away from the attribute vectors of another class. And then um, to do zero shot learning, um, we uh, basically train this, learn this mapping using training images that come from a certain set of classes. And then um, when a, a new image comes, we project it onto the image feature space and then onto the class attribute space. And then we look for uh, the closest attribute vector. If we are doing zero shot learning, then um, uh, we search only among the labels of unseen classes. If we do generalized zero shot learning, uh, our search space includes all of the classes. We, um, there are many benchmark data sets for zero shot learning. Two of them, the most widely used ones are animals with attributes with 50 classes and 40 of them are used for training, 10 for test. Um, and it contains 85 attributes. These come from uh, experts. And Caltech Birds data set contains 200 classes. Uh, the images of 150 classes are used for training and 50 for test. And we need many more attributes because these objects are visually very similar to each other. And they also come from experts. So um, if we only had access to the class labels and we were training a deep neural network like ResNet, then uh, so this um, first, the first column shows the uh, accuracy on unseen classes. So if an image comes from an unseen class, what would be the accuracy? And the accuracy is the number of correctly uh, classified samples in a class divided by the to total number of samples in, a in this class. And this uh, is summed up for all the classes and divided by the number of classes. We do this for unseen images that come from unseen classes and seen classes separately. And H is the harmonic mean. This is the final accuracy we want to um, optimize. So um, um, ResNet with a certain set of labels is not able to uh, give uh, predict any of the unseen labels. So this uh, value becomes zero. It is very good at uh, predicting um, the labels on seen classes, but the harmonic mean is zero because of this. And uh, using multimodal embeddings, we see that we, we are able to predict uh, images that come from unseen classes and seen classes and the harmonic mean is okay. Um, but there are lots of problems with this, uh, with these numbers. It's first of all, it's accuracy. So 23% accuracy, uh, which is quite low. And um, there is a very large difference between unseen and seen class accuracies. This means that the classifiers are biased towards seen classes. And the third problem is we need attributes, especially for um, uh, for birds type of fine grained data sets. We actually need experts to be able to uh, do this kind of train this kind of models. So let's try to fix some of these problems. The one problem is uh, I mentioned are the presence of attributes. So how can we eliminate that? We thought instead of um, uh, asking experts, we could just show these images to Amazon Mechanical Turk uh, users, novice users, and ask them to talk about um, whatever they found interesting about this image. We gave them, um, we only constrained them to talk about the object, not the background. Uh, and we, we asked them not to talk about the activity or the action this object is doing. So they had to only talk about visual properties. And we asked them to talk about at least three properties and use at least 10 words. And uh, of course, some annotators stick with these rules and some not. But uh, all in all, they gave us sentences. These are randomly sampled that look like this. They are quite um, visually discriminative and um, quite interesting. So the next step is to build vectorial representations from these sentences. And there are many different ways of doing that. One way that we found effective was um, to use a hybrid of convolutional and sequential encoding. So um, we take the sentence 
and divide it to characters. So every character is represented with a binary one hot vector, depending on the position of the letter in the alphabet, that value in the vector will be one, the rest will be zero. And then the, um, the sentence becomes a matrix of zeros and ones on which we can do convolutions. So we have a convolutional encoding. And then on top, we uh, stacked an RNN on top of this uh, to encode the sequence information in, a, in an abstract manner. And the hidden unit activations of this uh, RNN um, is a vector, and that um, is the representation of this sentence. Now, if we want class-based representations, we can do this for all of the sentences that belong to the same class and average them. There are probably many different better ways of aggregating sentences, but this, uh, this was one simple method that worked well. Um, so in the classification task, the sentences already gave us good results. And then we thought um, um, we can make a, even a better use of these sentences by using them as a conditioning variable um, uh, and using an, um, so get generating images using this natural language as a data augmentation mechanism. Um, so as you all know, um, GAN is a, is a framework where we have two neural networks that compete with each other. Um, so it, the generator starts with a noise and then there is upsampling until a noisy image is generated. And in the discriminator, it sees every once in a while real and um, uh, fake images that it um, learns to distinguish. And in this uh, conditional version of the GAN, we just take the, uh, the vector, so um, the vector that corresponds to this sentence and concatenate it to the noise, and then there's upsampling. And in the discriminator, we can also uh, uh, design it as a conditional discriminator uh, that basically learns to say this image is real or fake. Um, also, learns to recognize that uh, using real images and corresponding text, um, which, uh, so the semantic meaning of a, of, a, of a sentence or of a bunch of a series of words. And then after training this network uh, with training images and training classes, we can, we, we freeze it, we freeze the generator. And now we can take the uh, sentence encodings of unseen classes, either on the class level or in, in the image level, and generate images of unseen classes that we can use to train softmax classifiers now. Um, so the images that we generated looked like this. Um, Bluebird with black beak is an unknown sentence that generated this image. Redbird with black beak generated this image. And um, the language aspect gives us flexibility to generate as many images as we want by interpolating between these two sentences. So these images were generated with the interpolations. That doesn't uh, necessarily correspond to some semantic meaning, but uh, is a useful technique to do to, both to better train the, the network and also generate more samples. But of course, over time, this, these results are now much, much more improved. But our starting point was zero-shot learning. And so if we, uh, this, these are results I already showed before. Uh, these were the um, uh, accuracies on the BIRDS data set uh, using only real data, using multimodal embeddings framework. And if we, train a softmax classifier using generated images and real images of seen classes. These are the accuracies we get. Um, so the unseen class accuracy doesn't really improve. Seen class accuracy drops significantly, and then the harmonic mean drops as well. So this is not better than having no images. But uh, if we actually want to do classification, we don't necessarily want to need to uh, go all the way to the pixels and then extract features from those noisy uh, signals. Instead, we can take these sentences and uh, directly generate image features from them, which is a much more easy task. So um, we can design a, again a, a GAN model, a generative adversarial net network conditional GAN model um, that uh, doesn't need to be um, 
convolutional, but instead it can be just an MLP, uh, both in the discriminator and the, uh, in the generator, that um, takes sentence as a conditioning variable and generates features of um, unseen classes. And the discriminator now needs to say this image feature is real or fake. And um, basically our scene class um, set then would be features extracted for, from real images and the unseen class set would be features generated by the generator. And we combine them to train a classifier. So if we look at the results, then um, there, it's a better uh, picture. So the unseen class accuracy improves quite significantly. Seen class accuracy improves over the generated images, but still is behind the seen class accuracy of multimodal embeddings framework. Okay. So there are many different ways of uh, synthesizing features. And one of them, of course, is the VAE framework. And uh, again, we can operate it in the feature level. So um, we extract feature image features from uh, real images, and then we have an encoder decoder framework um, in the feature level. And then we have um, another encoder decoder that operates on the attribute or, or the sentence level. So these two um, VAEs don't communicate at the moment. We have added two um, additional loss functions to uh, kind of align them. So the first loss function is the distribution alignment. It ensures that the, mu the mean and the standard deviation of the latent embeddings uh, of learned by the image features and by the class embeddings are as close as possible to each other. And then this uh, cross alignment um, uh, loss uh, tries to make sure that the latent em embeddings learned by the uh, image features is good enough to reconstruct the class embeddings and the uh, latent embeddings learned by the class embeddings are enough to reconstruct the image features. So after training this model um, with uh, images of real, uh, of uh, uh, training classes, of scene classes, we can again freeze. And this time we can sample from either of these latent uh, embeddings actually. We don't have to reconstruct and make uh, image features. So this is a much lower uh, dimensional space. Um, so the scene class um, features are the latent embeddings of, that come from images of scene, uh, uh, class embeddings of scene classes if we sample from here and, um, and unseen classes if we, if we are building an unseen class embedding space. And we combine these to train a classifier. This improves results further, and uh, mainly because the unseen class accuracy imp improves. So the stopping criteria for um, training these models was the harmonic mean. So this is the uh, um, accuracy we are trying to optimize. And this seems to be the best uh, configuration for that. There may be some uh, configurations where the seen class accuracy is higher, but then the unseen class accuracy must have been much lower than this. And we can combine the two gener generator models. Um, basically, uh, we have a conditional um, VAE that uh, this time takes an uh, image feature and then a class embedding is concatenated to the latent features that are learned. And then uh, we try to reconstruct the uh, scene, scene class image feature. And then uh, the decoder of the VAE is shared uh, with the generator of the GAN, uh, where we consider only the top uh, flow. And uh, here we sample from a, a Gaussian distribution, the noise vector, and then we have the class em embeddings um, of scene classes that we concatenate to the noise, and then we generate features of scene classes. And uh, then the this discriminator now has to distinguish between um, real features um, generated, the features that are generated by the GAN and the features that are reconstructed by the VAE. 
Yeah, and then uh, if when we want to do zero shot learning, now we can uh, freeze this generator and concatenate the concatenate the unseen class embedding to the noise, uh, like it is shown here, and generate features of unseen classes. And this improves results further. Um, when we uh, do classification using intermediate representations like attributes, um, there are other, uh, other problems with using attributes. One of them being uh, that these attributes are usually correlated with each other. They often co-occur. So for example, um, the model while recognizing this particular class, uh, it learns that yellow throat and yellow belly always occur together. So it associates this co uh, combination to, to a particular class and, and similarly other combinations. But when uh, at test time it receives an object with unusual combinations, it doesn't, it hasn't learned to disentangle between them. So um, th that's where usually the, those models fail. So to improve the locality of the representations, we proposed an attribute prototype network where we group attributes first manually, those, but those groups are uh, already, they come from the attribute annotations. Um, so for example, the um, uh, attributes that talk about the belly is grouped together. And then uh, we, learn, uh, uh, we learn prototypes, attribute prototypes that correspond to each of these attributes represented in one group. And then um, we have, um, so we uh, kind of embed these attribute prototypes onto the uh, features of the image to um, have this um, attention map. And the peak of the attention map could be considered as the value of the attribute, the predicted value of the attribute for that image. And then we can uh, basically minimize a re the regression loss between the attribute, the real attri class attribute vectors and the predicted attribute vectors. Um, so, these values that are predicted, the attribute values, can be backpropagated uh, through the network to build, to uh, learn at an attention for that particular attribute prototype. And uh, to show that we improve the locality of these representations, we have uh, several qualitative examples in the paper um, uh, that shows that when the attribute talks about different body parts, they actually point to the correct body part. Whereas um, a framework that is very similar to uh, multimodal embeddings um, uh, gets confused with different, um, with different body parts. And that generalizes to other data sets too, um, like animals with attributes, um, where some interesting patterns also occurred. So for the stripes, class uh, attribute. These are the visualizations for, for the classes that actually contain stripes. Uh, but in some cases, the images, although the class uh, doesn't contain that attribute, the images might have those patterns and the model got confused with those patterns and um, hi highlighted uh, these parts. When it comes to learning with attributes, those were the results that I had shown. Uh, learning with attribute prototypes already improves results in, um, impressively, significantly. This is not a generative model. It just um, uh, has a better local representation for attributes. And then we can integrate it into generative models to generate uh, features, like the, the real features then in the GAN is going to be these uh, features that are extracted from the attribute prototypes. Then this improves the results a little bit more, but uh, once the, uh, the image features are really high quality or more expressive, then the generative models don't really help so much. As a conclusion, we use attributes as exp explanations, and uh, they are a means for transferring knowledge from seen to unseen classes. They can be used to generate features of unseen classes, 
and um, our attribute prototypes explain the decisions taken by uh, the neural network or maybe makes it a little bit more transparent by localizing discriminative attributes. Um, this second part of my talk is shorter than the first one, um, where I would like to talk about generating explanations using attributes and natural language. So com coming back to this data set, of birds and flowers with sentence annotations, we would like to use these sentences as explanations. Um, so what makes a, an explanation different from a description is that um, an explanation needs to focus on class discriminative properties of the object. Um, so it shouldn't talk about any, anything that is present in the image, but things that are specific to the class. And also they need to be image relevant. So uh, for example, um, for to distinguish a class from, from another one, uh, some certain properties may be important, but if they are not present in the image, they shouldn't be um, mentioned. So, um, to achieve that, we developed a simple uh, language model that is conditioned on um, the features that come, the image features that come out of a deep neural network, that it's a perception network like ResNet. And um, uh, the ResNet already has the class prediction. This is not zero shot learning, uh, but normal classification. So we have the image feature and the class label we uh, concatenate them and we condition the LSTM a language model that worked well at that time. Um, and the loss is um, slightly modified. The fluency loss is kept. Uh, on top of that, we have a, a class discriminative loss where once we generate the sentence, we um, um, evaluate the, the semantic content of the sentence. If it, con if it has enough information to be classified correctly, then we keep the sentence, otherwise we sample a new one. So, but the generating sentence uh, explanations like this doesn't necessarily ensure image, discrimin uh, image relevance because still the uh, decision has been made by a, a black box neural network. So how can we improve the image relevance? We thought we can take the sentence and divide it into noun phrases uh, using an attribute chunker, which is a part of speech tagger. It is, there is no learning in it. It just searches for adjective noun combinations in the sentence. And then um, we have a uh, grounding model that is trained on a different data set because this data set doesn't contain bounding boxes that uh, roughly is able to say, this uh, noun phrase is found in this part of part of the image. And then we can do it for uh, all the alternative sentences that are predicted by the language model. And then we rank these sentences based on how well, um, uh, how high the cumulative score of the uh, noun phrase bounding box combination is. And then we keep the sentence with the highest score. When we look at the results, the right result is obtained with the, the first naive explanation model. Um, and this one is the one that has the, um, the bounding box part. Um, this is a, because it's a template, red winged blackbird, the, the middle is predicted label. And the rest of the sentence is generated. And we see that um, when, we, and when we force the model to uh, ground the uh, noun phrases, it actually generates more like better sentences. And we can also um, solve tasks like generating contrastive explanations. So it's a little bit um, of manual um, intervention here. So the first image is the image that the model sees. And the second one is um, the image that comes from another class that is closest to the first image. And the model doesn't see this, but we use the sentences of this image to determine the counterfactual phrase. So, uh, and we do that by 
um, evaluating all the noun phrases of the counterfactual sent sentences on the original image. And if the, uh, the, the, the phrase that has the lowest score uh, may indicate that this phrase is not present in the image. So that might, may be the counterfactual phrase. And by doing that, we generated this sentence. The first sentence is the positive sentence. So blackbird and the small orange beak are the evidences for this class. And it's not a red-faced cormorant, the class of this image, because it doesn't have long flat bill. And long flat bill because apparently this phrase had the lowest score in, for this image. When we apply this um, um, language model on more practical scenarios like uh, videos of uh, driving. These are 30 to 40 second videos um, uh, taken from the first person point of view. And we collected sentences uh, that correspond to these. And um, the model um, didn't have bounding boxes, but attention maps. It was uh, learning through these attention maps. And these were the sentences that were generated. So it worked quite well for this for an, uh, an alternative perception module. One more um, interesting uh, take on explainability, I think, is to be able to serve uh, better to the communication partner. So typically, when we do explanations, when we uh, talk to each other about describing a certain concept, uh, depending on who we are talking to, the way we explain things change. For example, we talk to a five-year-old differently from a, a ten-year-old versus a, an expert of that um, of that concept. So we wanted to imitate this behavior uh, in the through this simple image reference game. Um, so the task here is that two uh, neural networks are communicating with each other through language, simple language. Um, and the first one <coughs> selects one of these images and describes that image to the second one and using attributes. And um, the second one is able to understand everything, but there is a problem in the perception. And uh, sometimes some of the um, uh, attribute related information gets lost. So there is a corruption. Let's say this um, um, model is colorblind. So if the uh, word of choice is uh, to describe this, uh, one of these images is color, then this is not going to be able to understand it. So the first uh, agent, the speaker, by playing this game uh, many times with the listener, needs to figure out the disability of the dis listener and choose attributes that are not highly, the highest discriminative, but still discriminative enough for, this, for the communication partner. So instead of saying um, yellow here, the agent says round, and this way the colorblind agent is able to uh, pick the correct image. Um, it's a, um, so this model is composed of two parts. We have a speaker and a listener. The perception modules are exactly the same. So um, an image is presented. There's a deep neural network ResNet here for, the, um, for, for uh, both of the images. And then we have a, an attribute predictor, like the multimodal embeddings. And that gives us the, uh, the strength of each attribute for each image. And then we um, subtract these two vectors from each other. And then this determines the, um, uh, the highly discriminative, the most discriminative uh, attribute for that image. So in the first uh, gameplay, of course, red beak is presented for this example uh, to the listener. But the listener does the same operation and then sees that uh, red beat, beak is not correctly predicted because there is a um, noise and uh, it's not going to be able to, oops, it's not going to be able to uh, pick the correct image. So the reward of minus one gets communicated to the speaker. The speaker update, it updates its um, uh, memory about the, uh, the type of the agent. 
and uh, then this uh, is fed into uh, into this poli policy learning um, to update the policy that is used to pick the uh, the most discriminative attribute. And in the next maybe next gameplay, it's going to predict uh, it's going to present the cone beak attribute to the speaker, although it's not the highest discriminative attribute, which would be enough for the second agent to predict to to select the correct image, and then the uh, the game stops once the reward becomes plus one. One uh, qualitative example from the game, the real gameplays of the uh, of the agents, the, uh, when the uh, the listener is colorblind, we have tried different versions of disabilities like astigmatism uh, in an abstract way, maybe um, by blurring the image, uh, and it works equally well. Um, so the first attribute is uh, the, the most discriminative attribute. And the second attribute is the chosen attribute by the speaker. And these are the images that are presented to both of the agents. And uh, because the chosen attribute is related to color, the second agent is not able to pick the correct image. With more gameplays, this improves. Um, and we see that chosen at although the most discriminative is color related, the chosen attribute is patterns related or shapes related. And by the 100th game, the, uh, all of the games converge and we see uh, consistently uh, the speaker has learned to utter the attribute that is most discriminative for the communication partner. As a conclusion, I talked about generating visual and textual explanations in the context of uh, fine-grained classification, self-driving cars, um, and communication uh, communication game. And uh, these are a, an, an important means for uh, model interpretation, which is necessary to improve deep models, actually. Um, and it's also an so being able to communicate with the user is an important criteria to trust deep models. And it's a step towards effective human machine communication. Of course, uh, most of the um, uh, works that I, I mean, all of the works that I talked about um, doesn't really go into uh, much details about how the um, decision has been made. Uh, but instead the decision maker is still a, a, a black box decision maker and we try to kind of uh, have an have another model that is trying to justify the decision of the first decision maker and we call them post hoc explanations okay as a summary i talked about um, attributes and language based explanations they help uh, with the lack of visual data, uh, lack of visual data problem in zero shot learning, few shot learning. And um, I talked about how vision and language complement each other for different tasks. I talked about um, how we generate, how we use language, natural language to generate images of unseen concepts or feature image features to help uh, classification. And then I talked about also <clears throat> how we develop explainable deep models and why they are important for user acceptance. I wanted to briefly touch on two um, sets of ongoing works. How can we uh, uh, improve visual explanation through communication? And um, what do I mean by when I say compositionality? So, um, for a visual recognition task um, that uh, kind of directly assigns the, uh, uh, the correct label to a certain image, um, it's difficult to uh, understand how a, a deep neural network has come to a certain conclusion. So we would like to make this decision-making process more transparent by introducing uh, by basically restricting the, the perception module to giving um, uh, answers to the uh, questions that are asked by the communication partner. So the aim is the uh, speaker or the first agent to find 
uh, relevant questions to ask about this image they, to improve its uh, position in making a correct prediction without seeing an image. And uh, the second agent is able to look at the image and um, give answers of yes or no for these questions. So is it furry? The second agent says yes. And then this already restricts the search space. Uh, this determines the next question. Does it have whiskers? The model says no. And then the, uh, the first agent is able to uh, predict that it's a dog. So again, we have a, a communication game here. The uh, first agent, we call it recurrent decision tree. Uh, and the, uh, this agent doesn't have any perception module. So it only has a memory, an external memory that uh, and the uh, uh, the gameplays are saved in a uh, in the the uh, units of an LSTM, and then uh, this uh, the hidden unit activations of the LSTM is used to uh, learn a um, an uh, MLP that decides to um, that decides what what would be the most informative question to ask. So in this case. Uh, the uh, game has uh, reached this level, and here um, asking a question about the whiskers is the most important. And um, the attribute-based learner, it's a uh, vision-based agent that um, has a fully uh, discriminative perception module that is able to predict all of the attributes it has a, the same vocabulary of attributes as the first one. It predicts the value of all of the attributes that are that could be present, but is allowed to share the information of the uh, the uh, uh, the requested attribute. So the requested attribute is whiskers, and this model says no, and that um, helps the the first agent to update its beliefs about what uh, uh, this. Uh, object might be. And the, um, this decision making process of or the, um, uh, the based on the questions that are being asked, we build a decision tree, basically. And uh, this kind of um, transparent decision making process or uh, combining classical, uh, classical machine learning models that are fully transparent with the um, uh, recognition abilities of deep neural networks, we can uh, basically benefit from both, both of the advantages. It's a fully transparent decision-making process and uh, it works, the accuracy is as high as a deep neural network. And uh, when presented two images that comes from the same class, the model um, first asks about white underparts apparently and um, the um, um, both of the images are uh, follow uh, uh, up to a certain point the same path and then until the end where um, the black wings property is correctly predicted for this image as and incorrectly predicted for this image because maybe because the wings were open and the black wings aren't present so the uh, classification decision was wrong for this image and correct for this image so we can actually look at Go, go back and see where um, errors might have occurred. And um, some other interesting examples, these, uh, these two images actually belong to the same class, although they look very different because one of them is female, the other one is male. Uh, and the first image is incorrectly predicted because the model was looking for a black crown. And when the images uh, come from uh, two different uh, classes, the, uh, the decision uh, that determined the separation was striped wings, it seems, and both of the images got correctly predicted, correctly labeled. When it comes to compositionality, I hope I'm not doing too much over time, but uh, it's going to be over very soon. Um, so what we want to do is we are operating in the zero-shot learning regime. So we don't have uh, access to images of certain classes, but the classes are not uh, like dogs versus cats, cats, but we have compositional labels like wet dog, 
or uh, ripe apple or red tomato. And some of these compositions are seen and some of them are unseen. The most um, kind of uh, intuitive way of building uh, such a relationship is using uh, through using a graph, graph structure. And we used uh, graph neural networks to, or uh, we first build the inf input graph, graph using the word uh, similarities between the compositions. Um, that come from an external resource. And uh, then on top, using the image features of the available, of the Im uh, images that come from uh, training compositions or uh, scene class compositions, we update the, um, uh, the weights of this graph using graph convolutional networks. And then we have an um, output graph <coughs> that, um, uh, that has learned, that has improved the embeddings of the compositions. Um, and uh, of course, features, Im, um, features of the images are, uh, 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 are embedded in the exact, in, in the same space. And this space is where, uh, for example, when we see an unseen, when, when we see an, an image that comes from an unseen composition, we can compute the similarity the way we did for zero shot learning to predict the label of that image. And these are some uh, um, predicted labels. So uh, for this image, this was the, uh, um, the ground truth label. These are our first three predictions, uh, which are seems to be correct. And in some cases, the uh, correct label for this uh, image seems to be wet cat, but the prediction was tiny animal, the first prediction, which is also quite relevant. And um, so one problem with the um, compositional zero-shot learning, the way the, the task was defined, is that uh, it cannot consider compositions that uh, are in, in unfeasible. So uh, typically, the models actually don't consider um, all of the uh, all of the combinations of uh, of the available object and attribute or object and adjectives uh, combinations. But they stick the the, pre the search space is restricted to the um, to the compositions that are provided by the data set. But in the real life, we don't we don't have that. Um, uh, the vocabulary is not provided, so but it's better to be able to say certain compositions are unfeasible. Although we don't have any images for unfeasible uh, or rare comp compositions, so the model should be able to differentiate between unfeasible and rare combinations and be be um, willing to predict or. Um, use the labels of rare compositions and discard the labels of unseen, unfeasible combinations, compositions, like ripe dog or hairy tomato. Although we have images of ripe something and something dogs and hairy something and something tomatoes, these compositions can't exist. We use visual cues to, uh, together with the language cues to determine the, uh, uh, the feasibility threshold. And uh, the model um, is able to predict things like, uh, for example, the, um, the label for this image was melted plastic, plastic, but the, uh, the, mo the initial model was predicting frozen gemstone for it. Um, yeah. <clears throat> Okay, as a um, uh, maybe the global goal for uh, deeply explainable AI, uh, this could be one interesting scenario that could face us in the future. So uh, let's assume that we are sitting in a self-driving car and the, uh, the car, the, there is nothing uh, um, special going on. So we decide to go to sleep. And then um, the next time when we wake up, the car has stopped. So uh, we, as, as the user, we would like to know what happened. And the model says, I was driving down an empty road. I decided to slow down as a ball appeared on the right, maybe also bringing up how that happened uh, on a screen. 
this is the ball. And um, I saw a child running towards the ball. So I decided to stop. So um, generating um, justifications that look like this is very, very difficult still because um, every second, every following sentence needs to improve the information content of the, of the situation. So it needs to talk about additional information. The uh, paragraph needs to be coherent. Um, and then when it comes to um, uh, employing these uh, kind of technologies in real world, we can't restrict the search space of questions. So the users might ask any kind of questions. What would have happened if you did not stop? The model then should be able to say if there was an impact, the child would have gotten hurt. Although this looks like a very simple sentence, it's very complicated actually to generate because the model needs to be able to um, imagine alternative scenarios um, and then handle uncertainties and also have a form of empathy as well because um, it needs to be able to say the child wouldn't would would have um, would have gotten not would have uh, been broken or something but it, uh, they would have been hurt uh, which also indicates the difficulty of generating language okay this is all from me and uh, thank you very much for attending and listening if you have any questions i'm happy to answer them yeah, thanks a lot. Um, really awesome work and, and fantastic talk. Um, I have a lot of questions, but I also want to give other people the opportunity, of course. Um, so <laughs> if anybody has a question on Zoom, um, just unmute yourself and turn on your video and feel free to, to ask any questions. Uh, hello. Hey. Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Uh, yes. So I have a question specific to the grounding visual explanations part that you presented. So yeah. uh, you were doing noun phrase and object correlation, right? Yes. And, uh, so how were you determining that which noun frame corresponds to which object? Did you manually annotate it or did you let the model learn by itself? It, it, it learns by itself, actually. So um, the, the explanation grounder is um, actually, it, it is trained with um, ground root labels, the ground root um, bounding boxes, but those bo bounding boxes are not uh, specific to birds. So we use the grounding model that is trained on MS Coco, uh, which is, a large scale data set, at least at that time, um, that uh, okay. was able to give us correspondence between, I don't know, let's say black legs, but the legs might be uh, detected for a, uh, for a person, for example. <clears throat> and then if you um, just apply this uh, model on these images, given the vocabulary, the restricted vocabulary of uh, bird related noun phrases, then mm -hmm. it gives us a noisy estimate of which noun phrases and which um, uh, bounding boxes might be related. Okay. I see. And, and, and the second question is, what exactly are you using here for computing the scores between noun phrases and objects? Um, those scores, if I remember correctly, come from the uh, grounding model itself. We, uh, we use th those scores directly. Okay. Okay, thanks. Sure, yeah. thanks for the question. I actually, so one, one thing I'm very curious about, what's your experience in terms of the data set sizes in terms of performance? Like how much data do you need to train these kind of models here? Um, so let's see. So the, um, the language model is pre-trained on, um, uh, on a large corpus, like I think, oof, I don't remember exactly what, but it's pre-trained and fine-tuned on the sentences of the birds. And we have 200, so we have about 11,000 images and every image has 
10 sentences. So a um, hundred thousand sentences. It's not that large. And uh, in terms of the number of images, it's 11,000. Um, yeah. I, see. I mean, I guess the reason why I'm asking, right? So, I mean, I mean, we're not doing the same thing, but you're, you're playing a little bit around with like captioning and, and so on in 3D right now. Um, and our experience is, is always that the language models, they tend to horribly overfit, right? So you basically do a lot of retrieval rather than channelizing across sentences. Mm -hmm. So I guess the question is, right? Like, I mean, obviously the, the goal is to understand really what's going on in the image versus how much, how much is happening in terms of classification, i.e. you have an attribute, oh, this attribute appears, you get an activation score, right? That, that's the high level challenge. I guess it's really, I don't know, do you evaluate this somehow? Like, do you have, tell me a bit about intuition. I'm really curious. This is a really difficult problem, of course. Um, so when it comes to automatic evaluation, so, um, okay, first of all, when, um, when we uh, kind of write papers on language-based explanations, no, uh, uh, it's never satisfactory to have uh, just um, qu quantitative evaluations using ground truth uh, sentences. So typically people want to see how other, other users or potential users of this, um, this technique would find it, how helpful would it be? So we run user studies as well. Um, when it comes to um, the quantitative evaluations, we use very standard techniques like blue or meteor or cider scores. Um, and maybe one advantage um, in this type of research is it's still a restrictive setting. We don't have a huge vocabulary. The, uh, the number of noun phrases is, is, I don't know, in the order of thousands maybe. Um, or, or let's say the number of words is in the order of 10 or 100,000. So it's not like the millions of, we are not hand, uh, dealing with millions of words here. So this is maybe one restriction of the, uh, of the model, but one uh, advantage as well. Um, so that's why we tried it on other, so to say restricted vocabularies of self-driving cars that also talks about, you know, um, uh, driving situations, maybe not all, all of the possible situations that could happen in the traffic either. Uh, and in that uh, slightly larger uh, vocabularies, this also gave us good results. But um, I want to be careful in not claiming that we are doing full explainability. It's not the case because the decision maker is still black box. Uh, but I think it's, um, uh, it's important to also maybe one analogy of, um, or uh, one kind of parallel of this type of explanations is uh, when we try to justify each other's behaviors to each other. Like I want, um, I don't have any means of um, determining what exactly goes on in your mind when you uh, make a certain decision, but I can still, based on the consistency of your behaviors, I can justify why, um, why did she lift her arm like this? Maybe she wanted to change the slide or something. So we, our aim is to generate that kind of explanations in this particular work. But of course, it's important to be able to um, um, improve the actual transparency of the decision maker. And one attempt to that was to integrate decision trees to the learning process. I see. So you basically know when you like, let's say you have a sequence or so, you know basically how the traversal of the trees was. And because of that, you understand basically what's happening. Mm -hmm. I see. I guess, yeah, I guess, um, yeah, my. Yeah, I don't know. I always have this challenge in like whenever we do like learning semantics and like just do image classification, right? It seems like we're not really learning semantics. We're just doing some accumulation of features and the model just does a majority vote gets you a result in a sense, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I guess the analog here would be you kind of doing a classifier for each attribute you're getting, so to say. Right? Uh, and, and the other way around too, if you if you do it the other way around for, for the synthesis models you had before. It yeah. It's also similar in a sense. 
Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so, uh, when given a restricted set of co uh, concepts to learn, um, presenting a real image together with its uh, paired sentence is enough to uh, kind of make a correspondence between these two modalities. And then uh, once we learn this correspondence, we can use it um, to improve the discriminator, uh, which is supposed to say the image is real or fake. So based on the sampled sentence, uh, this could be an additional cue to determine uh, that the sentence is fake. So actually, when we, um, coming back to that generative models, uh, maybe if I don't take too much time to go back. Take your time, we have time, don't worry. It's all good. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Um, so the fact that these sentences, like I said, has a restricted vocabulary helps, of course. Um, always the same kind of um, uh, images get paired with or a certain kind of image gets paired with a, with a similar sentence that th these correlations are very easily learned by the, by the neural networks. And then we exploit that. Um, but when, for example, the, the two modalities are not very closely aligned, then there are lots of ch challenges that come because of this misalignment. For example, if you do the same for videos together with audio, for example, then I, I'm imagining that there must be many other challenges. Any, any other questions? Yes, actually, I have a question, if I may. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for your um, really interesting presentation, first and foremost. Um, I have a question regarding these recurrent decision trees. Mm -hmm. um, so they're a very interesting take on kind of making the model more transparent. Um, but I wondered about um, the, basically the, the agent that is asking the questions mm -hmm. um, because um, the other agent is basically just, um, as far as I understood, it just detects attributes from an image, right? So it gives you a yes. probability distribution over all the attributes or more like a multi-class classification, basically. And then the other agent asks questions and from these questions, the other agent then derives the final answer, what the object that is in the image actually should be. Mm -hmm. um, and I wondered, what is the difference to just using like a final dense layer on top of these um, attributes that are predicted from this attribute space layer on the right side? Um, so it by you mean just eliminate the entire decision tree part, but um, uh, basically uh, uh, let the the perception the attribute based learner uh, output all of the attributes that it predicted. Yes, uh, I just wonder what is the benefit of actually having this decision tree. I think it's a cool idea, but I don't quite see how it's actually improving on, because the the whole kind of part of the explainability is in predicting the attributes already. Yeah, so it is actually not improving, um, not really improving the, uh, the perception module per se, because still um, the, the performance of the decision tree entirely depends on how strong the, um, the perception module is. Um, so here, um, um, Maybe for, for generalization or uh, so the decision tree is generated once and then that can be, uh, um, that can be used to uh, basically understand which of the uh, paths got kind of activated to come to a certain conclusion and um, Yeah, just predicting the attributes directly wouldn't. Uh, 
That's a very good question. <laughs> yeah, maybe it's uh, it's still ongoing work, right? So um, maybe that's an yeah. interesting thing just to compare these two and like how the decision tree differs from just having a single multi-layer perceptron because that's also explainable. It's just weights. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, any other questions? Maybe one last question. I have a higher level question. I mean, yeah. I mean, you've done a lot of really cool work about this multimodality, right? Um, mm -hmm. What do you think is the future? What what other modes do we need to look at? Um, yeah, I like I mentioned. I think the uh, so going beyond image recognition towards video and using all the um, kind of additional cues that come like motion dependencies and things like that through video. And then um, uh, maybe being able to use uh, other cues, other information cues like audio together with the video. Basically all the, um, all the uh, senses that we humans use to be able to recognize our environment should in, in the end be uh, used by the neural networks or the decision makers as well. Um, so in my group, we kind of, we have some uh, research going on for, um, for multimodal uh, learning in terms of video video recognition retrieval to, to using audio or uh, how can we distill knowledge from one modality to the other um, and i think in terms of explainability also um, just language doesn't i mean uh, only language doesn't have to be the means for communication but we as humans we also use many other um, uh, cues for communication these all um, are i mean they lead to many um, interesting areas for research. I think this uh, building the mental model of your communication partner um, is something that we kind of inherently do as few people, but um, uh, the neural networks that we develop at the moment don't necessarily have those kind of high or high order or um, abilities that go beyond recognition towards understanding. Um, I think also being able to handle uncertainties in, uh, in different situations and not, not just be uh, very confident in making a prediction is also important, especially in medical, medical, uh, scenario, medical imaging scenarios. When you want to do diagnosis uh, about a certain, uh, I don't know, disease or something, if the uh, prediction gets accompanied with, I don't know, an, uh, an uncertainty map. Like these are the most important regions to, to, uh, to, to care about. That would already help the specialists to um, boil down or, or restrict their, um, um, their gaze towards the most important parts or the most, uh, most difficult to recognize uh, parts in the image. And if together with these um, attention maps, if we are able to build explanation, uh, language-based explanation models that are able to say, look at, the, look at this part of the image. I see, I recognize enlarged veins and this might indicate diabetes. Uh, I think this kind of output would already help. Uh, help people, help uh, specialists. Yeah. Cool, yeah, super interesting. Um, yeah, thanks a lot for, for giving this amazing talk um, and thanks a lot for, for being with us. Um, and for everybody for everybody who's, who's listening, next week is the next lecture. Um, otherwise, thanks for tuning in. I'm gonna end the stream now.